Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to what is possibly going to be the hottest day in the history of the low felt, a predicted 43 degrees centigrade. It's already 29 degrees centigrade, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to be a stinker. There comes the sun. My name is James Henry. On camera we have VM today and we are broadcasting to you a very live sunrise safari from the northeastern corner of magnificent South Africa, the western fringes of the Kruger National Park. We're on a little reserve called Juma. Off to the east, west of us, is Arethusa, where we also traverse. I don't think we're going to go there this morning because last night at the pan just down here, there were three leopards. That is unusual. Two of them were in the throes of passion. Tingana and Tandi, who is normally seen to the south of us here, with Karula, the aging queen of Juma, looking on because Tandi, of course, had invaded her territory. We're going to try our level best to find them this afternoon. Brent is on the other vehicle and he's going to head down towards the pan and then towards it. Um, Twin Dams Road. Now, we had wonderful updates from Karen last night. She spotted them, I think, first on the Juma Dam cam. Uh, Lucy in Indiana, you saw them, and also John, you saw them there. So thank you for your updates and thank you for the attention that you do pay to the Juma Dam cam. Our plan today, we're going to turn around here, head down towards Philemon's Dip, see if we can't pick up the tracks of the leopards. This was relatively early last night, so I mean, seven hours ago or so. Tandi is out of her territory at the moment, so I think think that they would have headed south. Whether she's still around here or not, we don't know. We'll find out as the morning progresses. You're most welcome, and please do talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wilder.tv if you're on the email. Any questions or comments or feelings that you might have towards this sunrise safari or the leopards that we will hopefully see today, please send them through and we'll discuss them as we go through the tracking experience of trying to find the leopards. Righty-ho, on we go. There's some wildebeest over there. And Brent is not quite mobile yet. His earpiece is not functioning. So he will be out shortly, and well, you know how excitable he is about such things as meeting leopards. I'm not going to stop for those wildebeest, simply because I want to try and find these tracks before they become too aged and uh, decrepit. <laughs> That's too good a thing to miss. Let's just have a quick look there. You may notice that there is an enormous party balloon in the middle of quarantine clearings. What that is, <laughs> is a balloon that will hopefully carry a repeater station up into the sky later on. We are not having a birthday party, so that's what that is there. So Brent and Jamie said that they saw tracks around where I am right now during the course of the morning when they came across. They live just over there in a little place called Inga's House. We live back there at the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And as they came across in the darkness, they thought maybe they saw some tracks going down this road. I do not see any of those tracks, but of course, this may be a function of my blindness or a function of the fact that it was very dark when they came across. Here comes Brent now. He, uh, he looks like the Starship Enterprise in that vehicle with all the lights on. Hello, Brent. Hello, James. Am I blind or are you seeing things? I'm at the corner. I didn't stop and check. Oh, there. Too carefully. Yeah, there's some hyena tracks going across down there, but it was very dark. Looked like two sets of tracks crossing that corner. Going which way? Way, right. From the reports from the people who were with them last night, okay. they came up into this thicket below Ingers, and I could, I could hear them. Okay. All right. Um, well, I shall head down Philemon's Dip then. We're going to climb onto your car as yeah. you drive off. And there's a very spanky new thing you have uh, spiking out of your ear and towards your mouth. Yes. Good. Well, as you were, we'll keep each other posted, I suppose. Yeah. And isn't everyone lucky you just jump between two vehicles? Hello, Brian. Hello. Okay, I'll, I'll do brown. I'm gonna check. I'll check uh, Warburg's. 
There goes Vim in the sunrise as a dear pretty fellow. Uh, and a good morning. As James, I'm sure, was introduced, I'm Brent Leosmith. I have a Brian Joubert on camera, who is also sporting his little friend, the thumb. And we are in search of the mating pair of leopards that made an appearance at the Juma Dam Cam uh, last night. I did hear them at around 12.30, 1 o'clock, making that wonderful... <coughs> and then it sounded like Karula uh, responding to that with a... <coughs> But it looked like there were some tracks around here this morning. Oh, there they come. So James is going to check down towards a Philemon's Dip. We're going to go down Warburg's Eagle. I think they might have slipped into this block. Uh, that is just to the left of James. So Aaron in New Zealand is wondering if there's been any word on the Anderson male leopard since we are on the move and looking for leopards. Uh, Aaron, that, not that I've heard. Um, I heard. He has been spending a little bit more time in the south uh, of the Western Sabi Sands and down towards the Sand River. Now, what happens when you get very big uh, dominant males in the past in this area, uh, they have gravitated towards the Sand River being the best leopard territory around and uh, in the past there was a male called Tyson and a couple of other very big male leopards that have after initially establishing territory oh, here we go um, after initially establishing territory they have moved further towards the Sand River See if I can get the light in the right spot there. And there we go. Leopard tracks. Two sets. Those are the easiest ones to see at the moment. Heading straight down back towards the Mawati River system. Let me just inform James that he is where the tracks are heading. Uh, ones of Leopards is heading northeast down Warburg's Eagle. And our trick is to find where they actually left the road. I think they might have. Snuck off here. I haven't. Did they go to visit? They did too, look at that. They've gone straight down this little road to the left here. I wonder if they decided that our garden or next to the pool was a good place. They've walked straight towards the house that Scott, Nikki, and myself and Jamie and Eugene live in. And they've cut down into the block It looks like they've gone around the edge of our fence and towards the Juma Pan. Now, of course, there's always the conundrum of deciphering whether these are the tracks of them arriving or the tracks of them departing. But from Scott, before he went to bed last night, told me they did come up towards the house after they were finished viewing. But I'm just going to do another loop down. tracks go into the block between or below Inga's house. I'm going to loop round towards the Juma waterhole. Sorry James, go again. To the east of Inga's. Um, 
could be the tracks of them arriving. I'm not 100% sure. I'm just going to go have a double check on twin dams around the waterhole. But it is an absolutely gorgeous morning. Now oh, come on. Life doesn't get much better than what we're about to show you. Another set of tracks going that way. I mean, look at that. Sunrise. Isn't that absolutely spectacular? So it's a little bit windy this morning. Those clouds are magnificent. So, to confuse us further, there's another set of tracks right here. Heading in the opposite direction. Now, fortunately, we also have a tracking team out this morning uh, with a Jamie at the helm to try and decipher help us decipher which and where and what is going on. So those tracks come out of the block. The, the tracks we saw first came into and then through here. I'm not seeing any other tracks on the road. A very good morning uh, to Michael Fleetwood, who's wondering why would Tandy come so far out of her territory? He thought the male leopard would go find the female for mating. Now, Michael, female leopards have been known to pass two or three territories over to mate with males. Uh, the reason they do this is they'll mate with any male that might possibly come into contact with their cubs. And it's well known in leopards that they Sorry, Michael, I'm just looking at the tracks here. That they will, females will leave and go a vast distance from their natal ranges or their home ranges uh, to mate. So this is not unusual at all. Uh, it is very normal for a female leopard. Uh, male leopards don't actively look for, for females to mate normally. I mean, sometimes they do, but 99% of the time it will be the females coming out of territory and they'll follow the male and mate with the male while he continues on his normal territorial patrols. I'm just going to update the other guys quickly. Oh, there's another set of trucks heading straight west up the road from the Juma Pan. I'm just going to loop to the western side of quarantine, see if they come out. Hello, Vuldebees. Now, it is going to be an absolute scorcher today. Um, it's going to be, as far as I remember, it's about the, the predicted temperature for today is about 42, 43 degrees Celsius, which is over 100 Fahrenheit, if I remember correctly. I'm not going to try to do the maths because I just end up looking silly. But while we continue to search for these leopard tracks, Let's go have a look what Master Henry is doing in this glorious sunrise. So we're all going to be looking, I think, for these leopards for the next little while. We'll see what happens. We'll continue to track in tandem. Brent is obviously a long way behind us. Um, just checking around quarantine, which I think is a very good idea. And we are going to now check across here we've headed down to the south i haven't found any tracks coming out here tundi's territory as i'm sure brent told you is further south of us and i suspect that that is where she would have headed it's i suspect that's where karula would have tried to encourage her to go so to come south a little bit and then we'll cross east along this road and see if they haven't come down through the block here we will eventually narrow in, and Jamie's also out having a look to see if she can help us find them. 
And as we drive along here, just have a look at the sky. The sky does, in fact, look like it is on fire, as VM says. Now, Brian, you've noticed, of course, or listened to the fact that Tundi has come out of her territory to mate, and you want to know what the furthest a female leopard has ever come out of her territory to mate. I don't know, Brian, what the furthest would be. This is pretty normal, though. I've seen leopards going sort of two territories across from where they live in order to try and find a male and mate with him. I know that Shadow has been... Where's, I mean, Shadow's gone quite a long way west of her territory in order to mate with the Anderson male. I know that Karula's done the same thing, actually, so also two territories along. So I probably would say about two territories, depending on the size of the territory. Of course, the territories in this particular area are quite small because the prey availability is quite high. But if you were in a desert area or perhaps on the high felt, you might find that the territories were a bit smaller, at least a bit larger, and perhaps the leopards would be less inclined to go further afield. But of course, the, the fact that they do move further afield is important for genetic diversity, and it's important that the females mate with as, uh, as many males as possible in order to bring new genes into the population, and also to make sure that all the males think that they have birthed the cubs, because a major source, of course, of cub mortality is other male leopards. Now, I've seen no tracks yet, but I have seen many flies, and despite the fact that it is only just about six o'clock in the morning, I am sweating. There are flies a-buzzing, and we are staring down the barrel of a very, very hot day indeed. Please do not be surprised or angry with us if this afternoon we we're unable to take a drive. I, I truly believe that today is going to get dangerously hot here. But fear not, we will stoically survive. Mm -hmm. Hello, Bear in Canada, where it is generally fairly cool to freezing cold. You say, what do we do to avoid the heat? How do we stay out of it? And you say you feel sorry for us. Don't feel sorry for us. I mean, it's still very pleasant being out here. But this has been the hottest summer on record. Ever since records started being kept in 1904, some 112 years ago, this is the hottest summer on record. And I've certainly felt that being here. How do we stay cool? We sit in the shade, basically. That's all we can do. Um, our rooms tend to turn into little uh, ovens. And so we... we make sure that we're not inside them. There is a pool at Ingus, so we spend some time in the water. But you know, when it gets to this temperature, that water even is, it's actually fairly unpleasant to be inside. So we don't do much swimming either. We just kind of grin and bear it. But what is interesting, I've had two twice this season where the heat has really got into me and I've I really kind of struggled. And both times it's because I think I covered myself in a wet shirt for the course of the day. That seemed to make it much worse. If you just let your body sweat it out, you just cope with it. And Valerie, on the matter of heat exhaustion, you're asking about the animals out here. Do they ever die of heat stroke? Do they ever struggle? The old, the young, and the infirm. Valerie, I've never seen an animal die of heat stroke, but yes, they do. And I'm sh absolutely, it would be the older and younger animals, that, less firm animals that would die of, or struggle from heat exhaustion. Certainly, there have been a few hippo in the Kruger National Park. Now, as we move further east of the mountains from where we are now, it gets exponentially drier. So even though a hot summer here is totally normal. A hot summer with so little water in it is not normal. And so animals are starting to die in the Kruger National Park. As I've said, and I will continue to bang out about this, this is a completely natural cycle. Well, it might not be. Here we go. I think that's from last night. BMP, you are not going to be able to see that, are you? Um, let me just back up a bit. There's a track here of a female leopard, a small female leopard. 
I'll just try and get into a position where you can see it. I might not be able to. No, that should be right. Can you see that there, Vim? That is a female leopard track from last night. And that's going up into the drainage line here, probably straight towards where we found them or where we, you found them for us. I think that's where they will be heading towards the Juma Dam pan. But that is not a new track. Jamie, Jamie. Right, let us continue. Keep going. What about the check? So as I was saying, a natural cycle of things for there to be a drought. The male tracks are also there. I'm just gonna tell Brenty so that he knows. Brent, I'm on Twin Dams coming north from the junction with Chelapan. It looks to me like the male and female headed north into the drainage line just after that junction. I'm pretty sure those are from last night there. Nothing from this morning that I can see. I get copy. I'll go back. I'll go copy. Now what we're gonna do is stop here and just have a listen because of course mating leopards are not silent creatures. They are not um, particularly subtle lovers. And there's a Nyala through there. So we'll just have a stop and listen, see if we can hear anything. And I, what I will do is be quiet for the next 20 seconds, and I'll tell you what birds we can hear as well. So I'm sure you notice how the dawn chorus is a subdued kind of, um, it's, you know, to describe it as a chorus is, is probably not really what it is. It's more a little smattering of sounds. There's a robin in front of us going <laughs> Alarm call there, Viam. On the top of the tree there. See there. You just seldom see these robins. He's hopping right on the top there. Brilliant. There he is. That's a white browed scrub robin, everyone. And he's al alternating between his <laughs> call and his. <laughs> and Robin in Maryland, you wanted to see today a robin. And there is the white browed scrub robin. You can see him making both of his calls there. There are a couple of Franklins calling. Otherwise, it is very quiet indeed. So that's quite, that's really nice. That bird is advertising. They're normally in the mid-stratum, though down in the tree, invisible to the eye. And he came up to advertise there, exactly the same way as a kudu will climb up onto a termite mound to kind of show his magnificent horns and let everyone know that he is the territorial bull. So that robin is just showing us that he is the big cheese in this particular area. Okay, let's head across to Brent, get an idea from him as to what's going on with his tracking. I hope he's having a bit more luck than I am. I'll catch up with you shortly. So, James said the last tracks he saw have gone into the Mawati River system. So we're going to sneak along Central Road at a snail's pace, trying to make sure we don't miss any tracks. Also, Try and see if we can hear. Obviously, it's a little bit more difficult when the vehicle's on, but hopefully, between Brian and myself and our eagle hearing, or eagle actually, we probably, what would you say, is good hearing? The hearing of a scrub hare. Good morning to Eric in New York. Eric would like to know what is the, how do we tell the difference between leopard and lion tracks? It's they are slightly different shape, but we don't really go into the shape of tracks. Uh, you look at the size. Uh, a leopard, a big male leopard track, is even still it's still quite a bit smaller than a, a lioness track. So the size is notably different. And hopefully I'll be able to show you a lion track today as well. So 
So it's a good area for them to have come out, lots of big paths. So Costa, still on the subject of tracks, is wondering how do we tell whether they are fresh tracks or old tracks? Now, in this particular circumstance, it's quite difficult because they, they are fresh tracks from last night, so they're less than 12 hours old. The problem is with mating leopards, they often meander in all sorts of directions. But normally, we will look if there's been any of the little nocturnal animals that have walked over the top, or specifically now in the early morning, if the doves who like to meander have walked over those tracks at all. Uh, also, if the wind has blown the edges soft, they come out, it is going to be around here somewhere. But Costa, remind me a little later in the show, uh, once we've hopefully found these leopards, uh, or we have a bit of a moment when we're not tracking, and I'll give you a little demonstration on how to age a track. Is I'm going to get to the top of this crest and then I'm going to switch off the vehicle for a, a little bit and listen to see if we can find those mating leopards. So Brian is wondering, are there any updates on Karula and her cub? Well, Brian, Karula was following around this mating pair last night and that is not uncommon behavior. Uh, for a female leopard when there's another female within their territory. But as for the cub, I think possibly the cub has unfortunately died already. I mean, there's an incredibly high mortality rate for leopard cubs in the Sabi Sands. It's around 75% of all cubs born die within the first year of life. And they are killed by various different things. The most un some very unusual ones, even if a honey badger happened to find the den, it would kill the cub. And of course, the obvious hyenas and, and lions. But from the recorded actual scene, cub mortalities in the Sabi Sands, uh, more than 70% are actually committed by other male leopards. And unfortunately, Mr. Tingana has got a reputation from the West um, of eating cubs. Now, this in itself is not completely unusual, uh, but the fact that Tingana has done it quite frequently in cubs that he's more than likely sired is a little bit of a worrying sort of stat now that he's a, our dominant male leopard in this area. And I think the day after we first, or well, it's the two days after we first found that den, uh, Tingana was seen in that area. So far, we've got no tracks coming out. So, and I said we're going to stop on this little crest over here. Now, the reason I'm stopping up on the high ground is not, and not down in the low ground is the fact that we sort of got access to, to the sound from two different little river systems. And hopefully, the sound will reach us. Whereas if we were on the bottom of a hill, uh, the sound might be blocked. going to keep really quiet for the next 30 or so seconds have a little listen oh. <laughs> little male diker it's very gusty this morning and this could also make hearing a little bit more difficult. You can 
Right, he's actually broken his right horn tip. So there, that dike is going to disappear. Brian and I are going to stay here for a little bit longer. We're probably going to sit for a couple of minutes. And normally, a leopard's will mate on average about every 15 minutes. So we're just going to sit quietly for a little bit longer. But while we do that, let us go back to James. Now, this is almost mysterious. We, too, have been stopping and listening and hearing nothing except the gentle zephyr of wind emanating from the deep east from whence the heat is about to start burning the back of our skulls. Uh, I might have to wear my hat so. And we've heard nothing. Now, the road we're driving along is called Ingwe Alley, which means Leopard Alley. There are no leopards here at the moment, but you can see how slowly we are driving along here, just trying to see if we can't find some tracks. I've seen no tracks on the road, but there's been a massive amount of activity on this road. There have been many, many buffalo walking down here during the course of the night. And the next port of call is going to be to check the Gallego pan, I think. Viem suggested we go and do that, and I think it's probably quite a good thought just given the fact that there seemed to be no tracks where Brent or Jamie or I thought they were going to be. It's very strange, very strange indeed. Lots of buffalo activity here during the night, but no buffalo as yet either. Anyway, it's a very pretty morning. Well, it is for now. But like I say, already the heat is starting to build. Our drainage line next to us, like this one here, would be an obvious place for a leopard to be reclining. But I haven't seen anything there yet. Now, all the way from Berlin, draw. You want to know about wildfires, and would the drought cause a wildfire here? No, draw. A drought? Here we go. Where they're looking, Bill. They're looking straight down here. We've got alarm calling Impala. We're just going to move slowly through here. They're looking down in this direction. I'm just going to turn off here. There, there they are. There they are. Right on the ground here. Well, not they. One. One leopard. Hooray. That will do. I doubted you for no reason, James. You doubted me for no reason, Viem. How oh, very nasty of you. Oh, there's the other one. Have you got the others? Yeah. Oh, yes, the two here. Now, this doesn't look like... That looks like Tingana to me. He's snacking on something, a post-coital meal, and I wonder... This. Yes, this is Tandi. It must be Tandi. It's the first time I've ever seen her, but the, the only reason I'm saying that straight away is that look at the back of her neck. You can see that it has been mauled. And that is totally normal for the mating that happens. And let's just keep an eye out for Karula. She is still in Karula's territory. This is fantastic. Yes. I had such a strong instinct to come down this road this morning, and I resisted it. All right, let me call this in on the radio, everybody. Stations located mating pair, Tingana and Tandi looks like on Ingwe Alley, which is the two track running between Philemon's Dip and Twin Dams Road, just to the south of Inga's house. Coffee, well done, Jim there. Um, Isn't they growling? Looking to get mobile. Look, they're growling. Yeah. I'll keep you posted. I'm just going to move quickly. Now you can see exactly why her neck will be covered in those cuts. Oh, 
Wales is just fantastic. Oh, I can't believe our luck today. Isn't this wonderful? Viam, you haven't congratulated me yet. Congratulations, eh? Thanks very much, Viam. Thank you, yeah. It wasn't blind luck at all, was it? It was highly skilled tracking. Mm, thank you. Go ahead. Do you mind if I join you for a couple of minutes and then we'll go out and see what else you can find? Go for it. Come from the Philemon's dip side. So this is a new leopard for me, everyone. I've never seen her before. I think she's rather splendid. Vim, have you seen her? Yeah, Oh, well, excuse me. She's got that... Uh, no, I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but she's got that fairly typical sort of shortened face. that the members of her family seem to have. I, if I'm not mistaken, she's Shadow's sister. Is that right, Vian? Yeah, it is. So she looks a bit like her mum, Karula, and like her sister, Shadow, which is unsurprising. Now, here she comes again. Voracious appetite she has. Any female leopard does when they're in estrus. They become almost desperate. Look at that. Isn't this wonderful? does make you wonder how, when it causes such clear discomfort for both of them, how a cat's mating can go on for so long and be so kind of regular. I mean, now, they will mate more than a hundred times before the mating is over. And you can see once every five minutes or so they will mate, and that will happen for up to three or four days. I'm sure there are brief, brief breaks in between. It looked like Tingana was eating something there. So maybe they had a, a meal during the course of the evening, a scrub hair or something small. But you could see how he would happily kind of have a morning rest, but she is, a, as is totally normal, she is the instigator. This is just fantastic. Isn't this marvelous? <laughs> now, Brian, you want to know why it is, basically, that they behave in this manner, why it looks so uncomfortable, and you are correct. Leopard, male leopard has a barb on the end of his penis. Now, a barb, for those of you who don't know, it's a sort of recurved piece. So the best way to think about it is a barb on a hook on a fish hook, which allows, of course, facilitates the hook going into the fish's mouth, but then can't come out again because there's a sharp barb. Now, why a male's penis is blessed with a, such a strange appendage, we think is probably because as he withdraws, it is painful for her, but we think it causes a contraction, which will then allow for the his ejaculate, basically, to get up into to where her into her fallopian tubes where the fertilization will take place. I think it also helps her to ovulate. I will move once they've finished this particular episode. Just listen. Isn't that a blood-curdling sound? If they go down into that drainage line, sorry, Vin. If they go down into that drainage line, they're going to be very difficult to follow. So there's a very steep drainage line there. And if they go down in there, I think they're going to be quite difficult to follow. Here she comes. Jamie, come in. I'm just going to get Jamie's location, because if she's going to come here, it might be worth her while going the other side. It might just sit there. Jamie, they're still on the road, but they look like they might be about to head south towards the drainage. I'll keep you posted. Isn't that wonderful? Look at that. Oh, that's wonderful. No, I think still come along in Gwerli. They've gone static. She's rubbing herself against the pole. She's obviously a bit itchy. 
She's actually rubbing where he's biting her. This is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. It's so exciting to see a new leopard. I know we should, we do appreciate our old favorite Karula a lot. But it's so nice for me to see a new one. Oh, and you can see the back of her head. And that's from just repeatedly being bitten by Tangana. And he will hold her down, of course, during the mating, or certainly as he withdraws, because she will flick round otherwise and slash at him. And he had a limp. Last time he mated with Karula, we got a wonderful shot of her catching his foot with one of her claws, and it really dug in there. So he does need to hold her down and then leap off before she turns around and swats him. The old term, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Now, some of you will be relatively new viewers. And Joel, you want to know how much this male weighs. I think he probably weighs in the region of 80 kilograms, maybe 75 kilograms. Now, in pounds, that's about 170 pounds or so. Okay, we're just going to sit here for a little while because I think she's going to, yeah, she's going to try and seduce him again in the open here. Yeah? Look at that. Now watch closely how this occurs. That was a fairly short example. Look at the dust. Look how cross she is. Look at her anger. Her ears flattened against her head. She's hissing. <laughs> we can't hear her doing it, but you can see her doing it. It's unbelievable. Reverse a little bit so we can get slightly closer. We don't want to disturb them. We won't disturb them. Now remember, these leopards are very well habituated to vehicles. They see vehicles a lot. So I don't think we'll disturb them, but we, at the same time, of course, we do want to give them a relative amount of privacy, given the, uh, well, you know, the somewhat sensitive nature of what they're engaged in. Pam, do you want to try the VR? We're just going to start this ball of GoPros on the front of the car, if that's all right. And what that does, I'll just quickly tell you what it does. There's a the ball of GoPros that will eventually give us a 360-degree or some spherical view of what's going on. So you could watch the sun over the top of them. You could watch them mating. You could turn around and listen to me as my face is bathed in the golden light of the rising sun. Here we go, here we go. You're recording them? No, it's radio. Oh, no. Now it's recording. <laughs> Just a bit longer. And you can see, I mean, imagine that. What I'm going to ask Kirsten to do, I don't know if it's possible, but the three play that we have in the final control can do a slow-mo. And when the time is right, I'm going to ask her to quickly replay you a shot. The time is not right now, but when the time is right, of a shot of them disengaging there. And you can see the swatting that goes on. And it happens so fast that to our initial eye, you know, and that kind of the speed at which we see, we don't appreciate the incredible speed and the number of times and the intricacy and care that he has to take not to be sort of hit by her. But we'll do that a little bit later. So I'm... Oh, he's just... Um, 
relieving himself there. That's a wonderful picture. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of narration to the VR ball, so please excuse that if it sounds a bit odd to you. To the left, the sun is coming up. It has come up. It's about to go behind a bank of clouds. It's very hot, and in front to the left, the female leopard is going off towards the male. She will try and seduce him again. They've been in the throes of mating probably for the last 24 hours or so. Let's follow them. has just gone to the loo in front of us here. His name is Tingana. And uh, a foul smell is about to assail our nostrils. A cat's dung is not very pleasant to smell at all. Now, what I'm going to do is park over here. Now, look over to the right-hand side, if you would. And I'm just hoping that she will come back and try and seduce him where he is now, and we'll get a wonderful view of them. So there she is. She's just off beyond there. You can just see her dappled coat walking to, along with what is this sort of leafy lined drainage line. A wonderful color. She spotted something down there. And he will watch her carefully. And he, of course, is just in front of us here to the right. His eyes, he's watching us quite carefully. And off to the left, there were some impala just now. That's what alerted us to their presence. They were alarm calling. And then look at the sea above us, a couple of clouds building, but I think that they're going to be scorched off by what, by what promises to be the hottest day in Lofeld summer today. Here we go. Here she comes. she makes. Mm. They've got a very loosely hung voice box and that allows them to make that tremendously blood-curdling growl that only the big cats can make. No other animal I know of makes a noise quite so terrifying. Lovely picture there on the back of her neck. If you look, you can see where the male has been biting her, holding her down. Let's just move again. She spotted something down in there, you can see. Uh, of course, this is very hungry work, what they're doing here. And so it is quite possible she will try and kill something during the course of their mating, which they will probably share, i.e. he will steal a man-sized portion of it. He's also seen whatever it is now. So he's just down to the left. In front there, to the left, sort of at 11 o'clock, is the female. She's looking down into this leaf line, drainage line, where there might be a diker, there might be a scrub hare, there might be some other small animal that could satiate their hunger. You can see his belly's actually quite full. I think he's probably eaten something, you know, during the course of the night. Here she comes again. This will be a wonderful shot. Let's keep an eye on both of them now. Look at the size difference. Look how much bigger than her she is. This 
is truly fantastic. Mm. Please keep sending your questions to everybody. Um, I know that I have been talking to the VR for the last little while, but that's okay. We can still answer questions and take any comments that you might have. We need to wrap VR. We need to wrap VR. Okay, I'm just going to make a clap. That just helps it to sink. Marvelous. Beautiful stuff. Virginia, I think you've probably answered your own question by just watching what's going on here. You say, do the females roll over after mating? Uh, like house cats, absolutely they do. I've never seen a house cat mate, um, but that's exactly what she does. And I'm sure that contraction, there she's rolling in buffalo dung there, that's quite common too. I'm not convinced that it's to mask their smell. I don't know why else they would do it though. She's obviously quite exhausted. So I think that, again, helps to... I'm sure it helps with the process of fertilization. So the contractions that she will have after mating and the lying on the back, I'm sure, helps the process of fertilization. Well, we don't get to see this every day, do we? Very nice question from Naughty Badger. I'm not sure I've heard from you before, Naughty Badger. But do you want to know if lions were to hear these leopards mating, would they come in and disturb them? Yes. Lions will not put up with any other predators in the area. Even if hyenas saw them, they would probably come and investigate. But certainly lions would come rushing in here, and the leopards would be forced to melt off into the distance. It wouldn't be difficult for them to get away from lions, but lions won't tolerate having other predators around if they can avoid it. Now, I can't really go forward from here, so I think we're just gonna wait. Um, I might be able to sneak in between them. Let me just try. If it does make too much noise, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Virginia and Kentucky, I absolutely agree with you. You'd think that with all this mating that Tingana's happened, had to do over the last little while, he would be hiding. Yeah, I'm just quickly look over there. There's some Franklins in front of us. And they're, they're all looking deeply surprised by the commotion out here. I find it so amusing. Here comes the female. Franklin's to the right, leopards to the left, and here they're going to mate again. to me. When I see a female leopard on her own, I never think that she's small. <laughs> Hello, Rich in Chicago, while the leopards move off. You want to know what the Shungan term for mating is? Um, Rich, I only know a fairly slang term I don't know what the polite term is. I don't know that there is one, actually. Um, it's, always, it's almost kind of, in a lot of the local languages, it's almost kind of implied. So there isn't a sort of biological term for it. Um, it's not socially acceptable to talk about such things in many of our indigenous cultures. So the, the term that would be used, I suppose, would be kunza. And um, I wouldn't throw that around if I came out here. I wouldn't start throwing that word around in, in polite circles. I think people would stare at you at the least and um, probably slap you upside the head at the worst. Uh, but I don't know that there's a more polite term than that. So that would be K-H-U-N-Z-A, Kunza. But I don't think it's, it's not a polite term that people would use in general conversation. Here comes the male now on the right-hand side. 
Hmm? You give me a clap for VR. Okay. Just have to clap for the virtual reality rig then. So now the female is still here. I'm just going to ask Jamie if she is talking to Taxon. So Jamie's just going to guide the other guides in, so we don't have to worry about that too much. But it does look like they might go into this drainage line and it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to follow them through here. But we can pick them up on the other side if they go through. There is a path that runs along the northern side here. Mm. Isn't this wonderful? See them panting, they're already hot. I'll just move up forward a little bit here. Judy, you want to know if a leopard would ever choose not to mate because of the pain? No, I don't think they'd ever choose not to mate. I think they might choose to end mating when the pain got too much. But remember, these animals are tremendously tough. Here she comes again. I'm just going to stop here and wait and see what happens. She's coming over there. See how he's probably had enough. But he will eventually be induced to perform. Again and again and again. Now oh, they're lying right close to each other. Maybe shall I try and get in here a little bit? I'll try and get a bit of view, everybody. They are lying behind a bush. As you can see, obviously. I'm actually going to stop here. She's just wagging her tail and hissing a bit. I don't think it would induce her to charge at all, but it's because she's feeling a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm just going to stop here. She's only about 10 meters from us, 30 feet. We could go in from the other side, if you like. What do you think, then? Happy here. Let's just wait. Yeah. Good idea. Phew. I feel quite uh, exhilarated by the this. Now, Teshmira, you are very validly wondering all the way from Texas how many days a female leopard will remain in estrus. Normally up to a week, Teshmira, and you're absolutely correct, they will stop mating once she comes out of estrus. That's precisely what will happen. This is just so very special. Maybe I'll put our nose in there quickly, just before the next meeting, as it were. Might just afford us a slightly better view. Turn the VR on again. Okay, VR, speed. VR is on speed. Now, I'm not going to clap now. I think we're a bit close. We'll clap afterwards. What that clapping does is just help to sync all of the seven cameras that are now filming Tingana and Tandi 
just prior to their next mating. I'm parked in the middle, basically, of a knobthorn tree, shaded by its wilting leaves and the drought, the worst drought in more than a hundred years in this particular area. And down to the left, of course, the couple. Tingana, male leopard, and Tandi, female. And she, of course, is well out of her territory. She is in her mother's territory, and I suspect that's why her mother is tolerating her at this stage. drives to come in. Well, here's an interesting one that I'm not sure I can answer the question to. Uh, Alice, you're in Ohio, and you want to know if they might consider stopping mating if it became too hot. Alice, I suppose they might, you know. I'm sure it would reduce. Certainly, I mean, they've been, not to put too fine a point at it, on it, they've been at it all night. And so you can see they're both panting already. I think they did eat something. They look like they've had something to eat. His belly's quite full, so that panting will have something to do with the fact that their bellies are full. But it's also the heat. We're probably just sitting at around half past six in the morning, and it is already 32 degrees Celsius, which is very hot. It's pushing up towards 90 degrees Fahrenheit already, despite the real earliness of the morning. So let's just wait and see what happens here for a little while longer. We're not going to be here for the whole morning. We will have to make way for some of the other vehicles that are coming in. So let's just see what happens now. Flies everywhere. Now, Nate, you're in Nevada, and you want to know, you say you understand why you can see the female is exhausted, but why is the male exhausted? Nate, these leopards are mating probably 12 times every hour. Uh, you could keep, try and keep up that rate for the next last 12, next 12 hours. It's exhausting work. It's also hot, and you can see, um, Viam, if you flick back to him, you can see his tongue actually sticking out. He's exhausted because of the physical taxing taxing physical strain of mating 12 times in the, every hour for the last 12 hours. It's very tiring work. You can see they're having a bit of a snooze now. There might be a bit of a hiatus in the mating. Oh, yes, she's definitely going to sleep. Now, Jen B, you are asking a very valid question to which I don't really know the answer, but I'm going to have a guess. You want to know how, how on earth he can possibly have any semen left after such vigorous mating and such frequent mating. Jen B, I think what you'll find is that a lot of the mating is probably what we might call dry, if you like, and the mating itself is not necessarily always for insemination, what it will do is cause her to ovulate. So this kind of strategy that they have, of this consistent, constant mating, I think induces her to ovulate. It, uh, it kind of prepares the way, if you like. And then I think you'll find that slowly as it builds, eventually he will release more and more, and that will in due course cause fertilization. So I think you'll probably find for quite a long time he doesn't ejaculate at all. That's my guess. I, I don't know that for sure, but I do know that the frequent mating is a function of the fact that it does help her to ovulate. You got her beautifully sleeping there now.
And there, yes, I think they would, and I think they did. So you want to know if they would stop mating if prey came along, if something that they wanted to eat came along, would they stop mating for a while? I think they probably did that last night, Bear. They look like they've eaten to me. They may have caught a young impala, or a steenbok, or a diker, or something like that. I'm just going to find out quickly how many people are trying to get into the sighting. Are any stations looking to try and get into the sighting of Tingana and Tandi? So we don't put more than three vehicles in these sightings, everyone. And we had a question the other day. Of, yes, I haven't heard anyone else. Uh, Jamie's just keeping me posted. So it looks like we're okay. We can stay here for the next little while. But we don't want to overpressure the animals here. And we had a question the other day about how somebody had heard that the area has become totally inundated with tourists, that it's impossible to have an intimate wilderness experience anymore. And that is just simply not true. And one of the reasons is that we li limit these sightings to just three people. Interesting question from Michael Fleetwood. Is it possible that Karula is still around and watching? I don't think so at this stage, Michael. It, it's possible, yes, but I don't think she is. I think she would have moved off during the course of the night, um, either to go hunting. We don't know what her status is at the moment. We don't know if she still has a cub. We haven't been able to get a very clear indication of whether she's lactating or not. And Michael, you want to know, would she then mate with Tingana? If she has lost her cub, she will come into Estrus very quickly. And yes, then she would mate with Tingana, absolutely. He is the dominant male of the area. This is his territory. So she may well try and mate with him. But not at the same time. In fact, have I seen... I have actually seen males mating with two females at the same time. So if she was an Estrus, there's no real reason why they wouldn't both be engaged in a seducing him. But I have often seen, and this is a very common thing, where a female will come out of her territory into another female's territory. And while she does that, uh, the attendant female, the territorial female, will be in attendance while they mate. So that's not uncommon at all. It wouldn't be quite as tolerated if the females weren't as closely related as they are. Of course, the, it was Karula's mother, who is isn't at least not Karula's mother, it was Tandi's mother, who was in attendance last night just keeping an eye on things, and that's very common. Daughters set up territories next to their mothers, and so because of that, it's not unusual for them to have a meeting every so often. He is panting, she is fast asleep, so I'm not sure what they're gonna do here, but while we wait and see what happens, we will nip straight back here if they get up and do anything at all. Let's head across to Brent, get an update from him, and we'll keep you posted. Look at this impala, full of the joy of the morning. Uh, it looks like some of the babies chasing each other about, running at full speed. When I first saw it, I got really excited, thinking possibly they were wild dogs, but then I realized that they were just having a good morning jaunt. And I think they're taking advantage of what little cool weather there is. And I wouldn't exactly call it cool at the moment. <laughs> it's quite warm. And we've just come to check the area around S Sydney's waterhole. A nice, huge herd of impala. Oh, they're about to start again, Ryan. Are they? No. Looked like they were about to start again. Oh, there they go. And you can see that long-legged sort of back kick that they sometimes do. This is all practice, training, like track athletes. And we've got some oh, young, oh, young, young ones having a little bit of a play. I'm pretty sure, even though we can't see any ones, those are two little boys.
But it's really fun when we see the Impala chasing each other around. They do seem to enjoy it a lot. There's little else at Sydney's at the moment. But I think that on the sunset safari, this area will be really busy, even maybe later on the sunrise safari. But just to keep you updated, we have found a set of lion tracks just of a single female and that head into the area behind us, as well as a really set, fresh set of female leopard tracks. But we're going to go have a look for now. Got a feeling it could be Tundi sister shadow in the area we're in. While we go find Tundi's sibling, let's go see what the uh, other sister's up to. Now, nothing has happened since you last left us. The leopards are still fast asleep. Why wouldn't they be? I would certainly be fast asleep for days if I'd had to achieve what Tingana has in the last 12 hours. And uh, Viam, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is ask you while the leopards are asleep to just point the camera over here to where there is a rather special little ant. No. I mean the polyrhynchus ant. I mean the ant, yes. Can you see him? He's just on this branch here. Well, we will go back to the leopard, I promise. I wouldn't choose polyrhynchus, the ant, over a mating leopard pair. But I just thought while he was here, we'd show you. And he's the ant that tastes like a lemon drop. If you pick him up and suck his abdomen out, which, of course, is, a, well, for many, most people, completely distasteful. Um, it tastes like a very pleasant lemon drop. We'll leave that particular polyrhynchus to itself. I think I'm not going to eat it live on air in front of mating leopards. Now we're looking at a very obvious rosetting pattern that the males and females have here. And John, you want to know if there is a difference between the male and the female rosette patterning? No, not that I've noticed. I mean, there's a difference between every leopard, of course, has a unique patterning. But I don't believe that there's any difference sort of based on their sex. She's waking up a little bit now, moving her head about the place. I suspect it's just the flies and... Viam, you said you spotted some ticks on him, did you? Ah, yes. His head is covered in ticks. Of course, his tail won't be able to reach there to swat them off. And they're obviously not irritating him too much or he'd scratch them off. He needs a good aloe groom. He does need a good aloe green. <laughs> Emily, you are 10 years old. Do you want to know how many spots a leopard's got? Emily, I'm very sorry to tell you that I have absolutely no idea how many spots a leopard has. If I was to guess, maybe you can count them if you like. If I was to guess, I would say a leopard has about 257 spots. What would you say, Vim? About 2,000? More. You think it's as many as 2,000? It probably is as many as 2,000 spots. I mean, I'm sorry about that. I'll try and find out how many spots a leopard has. I don't really know. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone's ever counted them. There's now a very pleasant breeze blowing out of the north, and I hope it lasts for a bit longer. Certainly for these leopards. They're not panting anymore, they're just breathing a bit heavily. You can see Tingana's belly 
is just rising and falling. I think he has eaten something not too insubstantial last night. So I do wonder where Karula's gone. I suspect she's headed off towards the Gowrie cut line, towards Biffleshook Dam. We'll see what happens. Now, Kirsten, of course, who's uh, sitting in the final control, delivering instructions to me. Uh, sweet and sultry tone during the course of the morning has managed to edit together a little slow motion clip of them detaching from each other so take a look at this and i think you'll be amazed at how much actually goes on there and how much we miss with the speed at which we see things enjoy it Isn't that amazing? Well, first of all, it's technologically amazing that we're able to do that. And uh, secondly, of course, it's just amazing at the, at the speed. And I mean, you get some very classic photographs. I'm sure if Brent had been here, you would have heard the machine gun fire of his 400 millimeter lens. But you get those incredible photographs of the male leaping up and the female flicking around and taking a swat at him. And that's precisely what you've just seen now, which is marvellous. I'll just tell you what I can hear in the background. There's a woodpecker tapping away at a tree. But otherwise, that subdued dawn chorus continues to be subdued. Very few birds calling. You can just hear a sunbird going, pss, pss, pss. But that's it. It's very quiet. And of course, one of the advantages of that would have been that were we driving along here and we hadn't heard those in parlor, we'd, kept, we'd have kept stopping and eventually we would have heard them growling at each other. you're in the UK, you're obviously a regular viewer, you're obviously also quite astute when it comes to leopard behavior, and you want to know about Tingana's territory. Now, just for some background, for those of you who don't know, there are three territorial males in this area that we see sometimes. The first is Tingana, the second is Anderson, and he is to the west of us, on Arethusa, but even the western fringes of that, and then the third, my favorite, Mvula, who's now 13 years old, he's pushing He's really getting on now. He's starting to lose muscle mass. He's getting old. And, Ollie, you want to know how Tingana's kind of incursion into Mvula's territory. This was traditionally kind of the border between their territory where they are now. But he has incurred further east into Mvula's territory. How has that affected things? Well, Ollie, Mvula has spent a lot of his time further to the east and to the south, around Nkoro and around Torchwood. And his territory will shrink as he gets older. That's completely common for that to happen. And also equally common would be the expansion of the neighboring male into that territory, unless another male was to take over Mvula's territory. Now, both of his sons, Mvula's sons, Quarantine and Gunuma, are around the area, Quarantine especially. And maybe he will take over from his father. It's not particularly good for genetic diversity, but it is possible that that would happen. Then to the west, the Anderson male doesn't seem to have pushed any further into the east. We certainly haven't seen him any more often than we have before. We've seen him once, I think, on camera, twice maybe on camera. But he hasn't pushed that further west again, at least east again. So I don't think his territory's changed too much. Tingana's has expanded slightly, but Anderson's doesn't seem to have moved further in. Nice question. Thank you, Ollie. Nice one because gives us a discussion point. It's incredible how from all that massive excitement and action, we can go to a sighting that could put you to sleep if you were a little bit of an insomniac. Those cats look so peaceful. Craig, is anyone trying to get in here?
Now, Tammy, this is an interesting one from you. You want to know if Tingana had killed Karula's cubs. We know Tingana has killed cubs before and possibly even his own cubs. If he had killed Karula's cubs, would she know, A, and B, would she then mate with him again, given his uh, dastardly behavior? Tammy, it is, she definitely would mate with him again. There doesn't seem to be any resentment. Would she know? She would know only if she had been there and present during the dastardly act. So, yeah, she would do both. She would know if she had been around, if he had snuck in and found the den on his own, uh, you know, perhaps smelling her scent, found the cubs and killed them, and then left. And she wouldn't necessarily know it was him. She would smell a leopard. I don't think she'd necessarily put two and two together and say it was him. Uh, it's possible that she would, but she certainly wouldn't then not mate with him. They don't have an emotional attachment in the same way that we do. I think we as a species, probably the closer towards us you get, you probably find some of the monkeys and then the great apes. And then us, of course, uh, we harbor this thing called resentment. I don't think that you'll find that many other species could or are able to express that kind of emotion. Would she be sad if her cubs had been killed? A lot of people will tell you no. You know, they don't experience sadness or mourning. I don't believe that. I think that she would. And I think if you were to, for example, see any animal out here that's lost a youngster, even an impala, which has a totally unexpressive face, you know, they don't have the muscles in their faces to express any kind of feeling. They just give off the most dreadful vibe of a young, if an impala female uses, loses her lamb. she would definitely feel pain. All right, we're going to stay right here. The cats are not doing anything. We'll keep you posted if they do. Brent has some interesting stuff to show you on tracking hyena and leopards. So, in our search for lions, we've come across a really, really interesting set of tracks. I'm just going to... Oh, I nearly walked away with that one. Getting confused, too many things on my ears these days. But there is a huge drag mark that you can see in the road here. Now, there are hyena tracks and leopard tracks. The drag is going this way. But the leopard tracks are really, really fresh and coming back this way. And I'm going to try to figure out where those leopard tracks went in a second. I'm just going to show you what happened. It's actually incredible here. So you can see that drag mark's really, it's really quite big. So, so quite a large animal. Sorry guys, I really bumped my knee there. It's really quite sore. Hit it in a funny spot. Ow. <laughs> So we're going to go back to James. I'll show you what we've got in a second. Amazing. Just got up. She just got up. You could see there she tried to grab his face. Get his teeth out of the back of her neck. Those huge canines. <laughs> Amazing. Right, we're going to sit right here. Let's go back to Brent, see what's going on there, and we'll keep you posted. So we're in the perfect spot now, whoopsie, to show you what's going on. So that drag mark has come from the top of this termite mound. And uh, where's the, the saw? There we go. Can you get this here, Brian? Yeah. Now look at this. There's a blood trail from whatever has been killed and dragged off. Now it's hard, but it's still a little bit sticky. So it probably happened early hours of this morning, and you can see how the blood has acted as a glue and stuck the sand together. But if we follow the drag further, a lot more blood here, more blood again. And then I get to the top of this termite mound. And 
leopard tracks, hyena tracks, all over the place. Now, can you see here, Brian? Yeah. Lots of blood has seeped through into the ground here, and there's patches of fur. And it looks like the hyenas found this while the leopard was away, because the le female leopard tracks are on top of the hyena tracks here. I think this is probably Shadow. And here we go. Look at this. I'm going to pop it on the dashboard so you can see it a bit more easily. So there's this whole bunch of fur that's obviously been pulled out by the leopard while she's been trying to get to the meat. I don't think she managed to eat too much of this, judging from the drag mark. But now I've got a quiz for you guys. Who thinks they know what animal? was on top of that termite mound that the hyenas stole from more than likely Shadow. And if you guys know the answer, pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So while we go, continue to try follow this female leopard, see if we can find her. Sorry, I'm still getting used to this contraption. Uh, let's go back to James, who's with actual leopards. I think that is just wonderful stuff that Brent has got drag marks, blood and fur. That sounds incredibly exciting. With any luck, we'll have two leopard sightings, except if there are hyena tracks there, of course. Chances are that the hyena has pilfered whatever that leopard killed during the course of the night last night. We are in the throes of a virtual reality shoot, everyone. And they haven't moved since we last saw you. Yeah, she's just lifting her head now. She may have seen something, or she is feeling the need again. I don't mean that in a facetious manner. She will, over the course of her estrus, feel a kind of almost desperation. These two leopards have now been mating, I said, for about 24 hours. It's actually longer than that. They, seem, they were seen coming across here yesterday. So it's probably for as long as 48 hours. Certainly the back of her neck, which is covered in injury as she looks at us. Uh, but it seemed to indicate that they've been mating for some time. And that, of course, from his teeth clamping in over the top of her neck while they mate, trying to hold her down, trying to stop her swatting him in the face as he withdraws. Oh, he's exhausted. We'll just wait and see what happens here. I'm hoping they're going to mate again, especially for our 360-degree viewers. She certainly looks like she might be about to get up again. I think he looks like he could quite happily sleep for the next month or so. Now, Erlene, you're in Texas, and you want to know if she stayed in Estrus for two weeks. That would be a very, very long Estrus period. It's more likely to be a week to ten days. Erlene, you want to know if she would mate with Tingana the whole time, or if she'd move on to another male. She may well move on to another male. It does happen quite a lot. I don't know what male is further south of her territory. Be a male in Malamala, I assume. She could go west to the Anderson. She could go towards Mvula. Um, to the east, so I don't know, but yes, absolutely, she may well mate with more than one male in order to kind of confuse paternity. We don't know if leopard le litters are able to have multi-paternity. Some cats absolutely can do that, where a male, more than one male, can father different cubs within a litter. We don't know if leopards are able to do that. We should know after some of the research that's being done at the moment on the DNA of the leopards of this area, but at the moment we can't tell. But yes, she would go off and mate with another male. Not necessarily, but she might, in order to confuse who's the who of parenting, because male 
leopards, of course, are renowned for killing young leopards. Something like 60 to 80 percent of the young cubs are killed by males of the same species. Here we go. No, she's moving away now. Exhausted. <laughs> now, Dory, I think one of I'm going to hand this over to one of our leopard experts on the viewing panel. You want to know? We've seen Tingana mating with Karula. Are we not? Do we not think that maybe Tingana could be Tandi's father as well, given that Tingana is mating with Karula? Um, no, I'm pretty sure that that isn't the case because Tingana's nine. Uh, Karula is almost 12 now. In fact, 12, so 12th birthday next month. And Tandi is the same age as Shadow, so Tandi's also nine. So no, there's definitely no ways that Tingana is her father. Karula and Tandi share the same father. Oh, that's right. That's a very interesting point. Thank you for that, Viam. Viam has just <laughs> told me that Karula, of course, and Tandi, and therefore Shadow, share the same father. So not only are they mother and daughter, they are also sisters. <laughs> now, that is not uncommon in cat life. And it's certainly apparently that kind of inbreeding can go on for six generations before there's any kind of deleterious effect. But that is fascinating. I'd forgotten that. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> now, of course, in human society, we would consider that deeply distasteful. But out here, it's completely normal. Bye-bye, Craig. They was just heading out of the sighting. They got here just slightly too late for that, all that action that we had this morning. Check the radio. A great panting going on there. But otherwise, all is quiet. I think it's probably going to be worth sitting here uh, for much of the rest of the drive, actually. And we'll let Brink track and see if he can find what left those drag marks. Now, Steve, here in Toronto, where it is chilly, Unlike today here in the low felt, you want to know what the gestation period of a leopard is. The leopard's gestation period is probably about 110 days, maybe slightly shorter than that. So 105 days, say. And that means that, you know, just over more three months after today, we could have some young cubs. Tandi, of course, though, does not live in this territory permanently. She will probably, or almost certainly, give birth south of our borders, which is where her territory is. She won't want to give birth within a territory of another female, even if it is her mother and sister. Nice question. Thank you for that. from Shell in Detroit about the relative strengths of hyenas, leopards, and lions. Well, Shell, there is no difference, at least no doubt, as to who's the most powerful there. Lions, far heavier, far more powerful than any of the others. A big male lion is up to 220 kilograms. That's about 600 pounds, a massive, massive animal. Uh, that's more than three times the size of this male leopard here. A hyena, interestingly, a big female hyena weighs about the same as a big male leopard. And I mean, pound for pound, they're probably about the same strength. The leopard would be much faster, hyena much more stamina, and probably a little bit more biting force than the jaws. The big thing, though, of course, 
around dominance and predators is their ability to take risks. Now, hyenas can take big risks. They live in clans. They scavenge very effectively. And so if they get injured, they can still eat. Because if a leopard gets injured, of course, it cannot eat. And so therefore, will not take risks. So even though it's as powerful as a hyena, it will very seldom actually engage a hyena in a physical box. Let's head across to Brent, get an idea of what's happening with him. We'll stay here with these leopards for now, unless you ask me to move on, in which case I shall. But let's head across to Brent, get an update from him. I'll see you shortly. So we just heard a snort, a single snort that sounded like an alarm call. And while we were still having a look around there, now let's have a look. All these Impala seem to be a slightly more alert than they were a little while ago. Whether the snort is from the joy of chasing each other or an actual predator around. So we're going to go have a look where those lion tracks disappear to. So we apologize. We are testing some new kits at the moment, so, so there might be a bit of audio issues. We will try to get them sorted. some interesting answers uh, to that what fur did uh, that come from we had a giant land snail which would be interesting because that'd be the, the first and only giant land snail I've ever heard of that is furry uh, there was warthog warthog have very little fur so unlikely to be warthog uh, in Yala the females are gonna have a much more orange orange fur and the males gonna have a much darker darker fur, so not in Yala, but good guesses, all of them, except for that giant land snail, of course. Well done to Brandon and Aqua, who said waterbuck. Now, it was quite probably a sub-adult, a medium-sized waterbuck. And that's the reason, just judging from that drag mark and the amount of blood, that she wasn't able to lift it into the tree. I also think it was a quite fresh. I don't think she had time to take out the stomach contents even before those hyenas arrived. So from what I think happened is she, she made the kill and it is beastly warm even at night at the moment. So she made the kill, wandered off towards one eye pan for a drink and on returning found that the hyenas had found that kill. So maybe if she'd had time to remove the stomach contents, it might have been light enough for her to hoist into the marula tree. You almost think it looked like the plan. She'd placed it on top of a termite mound r right next to a big marula tree. But I think the hyenas got there first. So we had that single lioness track just down here. We're going to go have a look at it again. Jamie's checked the western edge of our travers and she said she could only find tracks of lions coming in. So hopefully they're between those two areas. It's not too big an area to search. So we're going to go have a look now. So 
So a good morning to you, Tony. Tony would like to know how we tell the difference between a female or a lioness and a lion, uh, just according to tracks. Again, like the leopards, there's a vast size difference in those tracks. Uh, and a male lion can be the size of sort of a side plate, about the size of my hand, uh, where there's a lioness will be much smaller than that. And a uh, male lion will have bigger feet than its mom from probably about a, close on a year and a half, two years. So even as a young male, you can tell the difference in the tracks. Costa, and thanks for another question. Uh, Costa would like to know, would the lion's child kill the leopards? Most definitely, if they could get their hands or paws on a leopard, they would definitely kill them. And it's just removing extra competition from the picture. Okay, so we're getting quite close to where we had those lioness tracks. And they were coming from this area and heading straight down in Parlour Road. Oh, there we go. It looks like Jamie has found the tracks I told her about, and they've gone for a walk to see if they can find them. Now, I'll show you the tracks quickly. Let's show the ones in the light. They might be a bit easier to see. Got them there. Huh? There we go. Nice line tracks in the soft sand. So it looks like Jamie's gone for a walk to see if she can pull a lion out of the bush by the tail. So we'll let her do that. We're going to loop around and check ahead. So we're going to take this opportunity. I'm just trying to get into the right spot for Brian. Costa was wondering how do you tell the difference between fresh tracks and old tracks. Have you got any good... So how's that access there, Brian? Let's go to the second one along. So I'm going to get out now. And now these tracks are from sometime during the night. They're quite nice and fresh. Sorry about that, I'm having cable applications. So this one looks like the nicest one you got to share, Brian. Yeah. Easiest one. So now if we look at it, the edges of the track are very sharp, even in the soft soil. So if I had to put my handprint next to it, Oh, in the shade. Um, right. Let's do that. You can see nice sharp edges. So you can see that track is probably from sometime during the night. But now, if it's older and the wind's been blowing for a while, now you see how those defined edges disappear. Another very distinct and telltale sign is if you get the tracks of a dove or a millipede or something crossing it. And that helps us to age the tracks. So millipedes are act quite active during the night. They walk all over the place. Uh, the doves are active, very active for that first hour um, after sunrise. So these tracks are relatively fresh. I'd say probably be somewhere between 10 o'clock and five o'clock this morning. But 
often with following tracks, it's often much easier on foot. Uh, you can go a bit slower, you can see quite a few tracks that you would probably miss driving. Okay. Let's check around towards the power lines. See if they don't maybe cut a little bit further south and west. Jamie said she only had tracks of them coming into Juma, so it's possible they could be in this myriad of thickets that's around here. James Richard. James Richard, see that's where the line disappears. Would like to know if there are any updates on the cheetah that was seen on Juma. There haven't been, but male cheetah do cover vast, vast swathes of land and can have home ranges of up to 25, 25 to 35, even larger than that, 1,000 hectares. So massive areas. Hopefully we will be seeing a few more. The lack of water around is going to force them into certain areas. Now, it is already sweltering. Brian's just sort of shaking his head in disbelief how hot it is already. I mean, it literally feels like it's 11 o'clock in the morning. And what, what is the time, Brian? Uh, it's about 17 past 7. 17 minutes past 7. And uh, it's, I would guess, it's probably sitting in Celsius 34, 35 odd already at this time in the morning. The 35 is a 95 Fahrenheit and that's at 7 in the morning. Shirley would like to know why do the presenters never look like they are sweating in this heat? Shirley, I guarantee you we are. Fortunately, I think uh, the movement of the vehicle helps dry the perspiration. So, not too far off, uh, it's 32 degrees Celsius according to our weather station at Final Control. So I wasn't too far off. Now, let's have a look if these line tracks pop out onto this road. So, we need to check very carefully, I apologize for not looking back at you guys. This road tack is quite hard so I need to keep my eyes on the ground in case I miss the tracks and I know we all would love to have some lions to go with those leopards. Carol Christie would like to know, do we have air conditioning uh, or anywhere we can go to cool off? Uh, we do have a swimming pool and uh, I like to employ the, the Bush air conditioner, which having lived in a lot of places where there's no electricity, air conditioning doesn't quite, quite work so well there. So my Bush air conditioner is to take one of these and it completely drench it in water and then either wrap that around my neck or if I'm going to bed, I'll put one wet one down and then I'll wet another one and put a wet one over me to go to sleep. And that's quite effective. So once you get to sleep, it's okay. It's the getting to sleep in the heat that's the problem. Once you're asleep, you can sort of sleep through quite a bit of the heat. But no sign of this lioness just yet. A 
Alex rang her saying, I hope it's a, a weather station that you can log into, not the girls in final control running outside in the heat uh, to check it all the time. Well, the only place there is an air conditioner is in final control with all that sensitive equipment. But it is one that you log into and you can have it on your computer. But if anything, the girls in final control need the exercise. Of course, uh, there's been a bit of comments back on that. So, no lion tracks yet, just hyena. So, speaking of exercise, well, let's jog on back to James, who's repositioned with those leopards. What do you call your camera? Live, James. Oh, we're live. Mm. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I took my earpiece out. I was just uh, using my exceptional filming equipment you can see here uh, to film <laughs> this leopardess. Tundi lying in the drainage line. She is over there. Now, my head, of course, is in the way of Tingana, and Viam got very upset with me because I was sitting like that, of course, and he said, you're in my, you're in my Tingana shot. And I said, well, he then said that I'm not nearly as handsome as Tingana, which I thought was very unkind. I think I'm at least as handsome as Tingana. She's growling now. Here she goes, here she goes. can't move, I'm afraid, so we'll just have to deal with the light in the frame, I'm afraid. Just listen. Mm. It's just incredible. So we parked, basically, we're not far from where we were before, only about 20 meters or so. Um, we were just up there sort of in that direction up the bank and we came around and we found them here reclining on the cool sand it's a brilliant place to be on a hot day like this that sand will provide cool and shade and i'm sure they're thoroughly enjoying it yeah Viam, i'm afraid i don't think i can move i think this is probably the best view we're going to get i might just depress the clutch and see if we sneak forward no we won't you want me to try and sneak forward, Vindy? Just a little bit. That might get my great fat head out of the way a little. There we go. And we just hope this tree in front of us holds us from falling into the middle of the drainage line. This is perfect. Now, Bruce in Philadelphia, a wonderful question about is it certain or not that when she mates that she will have cubs? Bruce, it isn't. It isn't certain at all. And I mean, certainly for a while, we thought that Tingana had a bit of a problem, not to put too fine a point on it, that he might be firing blanks because he mated with Shadow for a long time and with Karula, three or four times each, and they didn't come into Estrus. The Karula subsequently gave birth. We know that. We don't know if the youngster's still alive. We also don't know, though, if she mated with another male as well and therefore gave birth to another male's cub. So. It's not certain at all that she would be pregnant here. It may be to do with him. It might well be to do with her as well, though. I don't think ovulation is something that happens easily in the cats. And some of you who have house cats or perhaps have bred house cats would be able to explain that a bit better. But I think that this consistent mating is required in order for the female to ovulate and then become pregnant. So I think it's quite a, it's not a particularly easy affair. Here we go. Listen to her growling. The back of her neck is so raw. You might also be able to hear the tapping of a woodpecker above us. Tick, 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 
Now, Mimi, just watch Mimi, watch this carefully, and I'll explain to you. Watch him, watch what he grabs when he bites it. Watch, see? So, Mimi, you're 15, and you want to know, is there a chance that he could break her neck? Now, if you watch carefully, like I told you to there, what, what he grabs is her, it's the skin, that flap of skin. They have a flap of skin on the side of their necks exactly in the same way as your house cat does or a dog does, and that's to protect them against being bitten by either leopards or hyenas or in a fight or anything like that. And he grabs that skin or her ear. And so there's no danger of her, him actually, you know, kind of penetrating into her flesh and causing her real damage. all is peace again and they have been spotted by a squirrel there's a squirrel alarm calling to the south of us and they have amazing eyesight those squirrels you know we so often hear them alarming that we don't know what they're alarming at and we go right up to them but often what they're alarming at is some distance from them she's investigating a little cave there the kind of thing that a leopard would use as a den. Surely she cannot expect him to perform again after so short a time. She is very demanding, isn't she? <laughs> He's exhausted. He's just laying down. Now, many of the animals out here, of course, have very specific breeding seasons and late in Nevada. You wouldn't know if a leopard has a breeding season or they're more likely to mate in summer or winter or when they're likely to mate. They're totally non-seasonal, totally unseasonal breeders. Oh, look. We can't really get a better view at this stage, everyone. So that sound is unbelievable. It's going to reverse quickly. Now, Brian. You've noticed, obviously, I've pointed it out, the incredible size difference between the male and the female here. You want to know it's because he's very big or she's very small or a combination of the two. He's not very big. He's a pretty standard-sized male leopard for this area. Now, she's not very small. She's pretty standard-sized. That's just the size difference between male and female leopards. So she probably weighs in at about 40 kilograms, which is not very heavy at all. Um, in pounds, that would be just about 100 pounds. And he weighs in about 80 kilograms, almost double her mass. 80 would be big, 75 to 80 kilograms, and almost double her mass. Sorry, let me just get on to the radio. Dave Cruz, do you copy? Station trying to make their way to sighting of Tingana and Tandi. Sorry, I'm just apparently there's someone trying to get into the sighting. I'm a long way away. I'm at the distance, but I'd like to make my way down there, please, if I can. Dave, no problem. Um, let me know when you get to Philemon's dip. Or quarantine. I'll give you an update then. They are moving around and there's some tricky drainage lines in here. And I'll be able to give you a better idea when you get around there. Quarantine for the monster area. Thank you. I'll take the vehicles. There they go again. 
she is totally insatiable. You find that each sort of event seems to get slower and sl at least shorter and shorter. I think that will probably be the case during the day and then they will probably have a hiatus of a few hours during the heat of the day and then sort of get busy again during, as it gets cooler towards the afternoon. I mean, this goes on for almost a week sometimes. I mean, it really is astonishing. And VM, will you just say when? Does that work for you? A little bit more. And I used to wonder the same thing that you just asked. You've just wondered, is there penetration every single time? It doesn't look like there is. Then there is, and she wouldn't become so angry if there wasn't because obviously it's painful for her when he withdraws. What you will notice the next time they, they mate, if they do mate again, what you'll notice is that that kind of thrusting motion he does with his, with his pelvis only occurs until he's managed to achieve penetration. Then he's almost still. So once that stops, you know that they have, there is, has been penetration, and then he will stop moving, or he'll move very slightly. And then as he withdraws, of course, there's that tremendous pain for her, and she has that growl. It's also painful for him. That's a glorious picture, isn't it? Panting, panting, panting away. You can see his dewlap there. So, I mean, a lot of people, it's, it's interesting, a lot of people have asked about his size and is he a very large leopard? And he isn't. He is a very impressive leopard, but he's not bigger than any of the others. Now, as you can see here, the female is basically setting up every time they mate. She is the one that initiates it. And Joyce in Pennsylvania, I think that will probably answer your question. You want to know when a female comes into estrus, is she sought out by the male or does she try and find a consort? Does she try and find a male? Almost certainly it is she that tries to seek out him. He will definitely pick up the scent of an estrus female and he might try and be around her. But, you know, she has come way out of her territory to try and find him. And so it's definitely the female that tries to find the male. She spotted something. She spotted something that she thinks might be a nice breakfast. But I suspect she'll lose interest. She doesn't look very hungry. I think they've had a pretty good meal last night. But, you know, I had a pretty good meal last night. I'm hungry again. I haven't been nearly as active as they are. You can hear the birds maybe alarm calling. There's some rattling testiculars around where that squirrel was calling. That's why she's just flicking her tail from side to side there as if to say, don't give me away. Squirrel is still going some distance away. It's possible there's another predator there, maybe Karula is approaching. That would be special. See what a perfect color they are to be lying in that dappled shade. That's an interesting question. While we were talking about Tingana's size and how big he is, and I was saying I think he's a pretty average-sized male leopard, that's not to cast any kind of aspersions on him at all. Vula, I think, is slightly smaller than average, and the Anderson male, I think, is probably... I haven't seen him, but reports from Brent, who doesn't tend to exaggerate these things, uh, say that he is enormous. And Blair Sinclair, that's a very nice rhyming name. You want to know who the biggest male I've ever seen in the Sabi Sands is? The biggest would, I suppose, have been the Campan male who used to stalk about the place at Lonlos in Singita. I'd say he was probably, what should we say, 10% larger than, than Tingana. 
He was a very big male. Tengon is not small, but he's not enormous. And it's, again, I've said this before, but it's so interesting the human reaction that we have to male animals versus female animals. Whenever we see a male animal, be it a male lion or a male impala that's impressive or a male kudu that's impressive, the first thing that we say about them is that they are big. So every time a new person or you see a male lion for the first time or a male leopard for the first time, you say, oh, isn't he a big boy, isn't he a, a big male? And it's because we're so impressed by them and because of our human nature, and this is something to think about, our human nature immediately associates male sort of impressiveness with size. Then when we see a female like this, we say, isn't she gorgeous? Isn't she pretty? Doesn't she have a, a beautiful coat? We very seldom will comment first on the female size, whereas with the male, that's the first thing we talk about. And I think it's a very interesting kind of um, indicator as to what we see in ourselves, what we see when we see men and what we see when we see women. See it there. She's she's just totally insatiable. He is exhausted, but she won't take no for an answer. She will insist. Yep. <laughs> this is also a very nice question about what they might eat. We've seen them eating something, or he was definitely chewing on something when we landed with him today. And Janet, do you want to know if they'll ever hunt as a team? Well, interestingly, I would have said no until quite recently when Tengana was mating with Karula and they both were eating a buffalo, a young buffalo. I seriously doubt that either of them would have taken that buffalo on, on their own. So we, no one saw the buffalo being taken down. I suspect quite strongly that they helped each other. So I would have said no until recently. Now I think yes, if they came across something larger than either of them would take normally, it's quite possible that they would help each other. Very nice question, Janet, thank you. Just gonna give a quick update on the radio. No, Brent's doing it for me, I don't need to. She is not taking no, and he is absolutely disinterested. There you go, brave fellow. Isn't that amazing? It's just incredible. making me think now you're saying how do I know that it's painful for him I'm no well I say it's painful to him because that's what I've read I don't know for sure that it's painful for him um, you know his response his kind of aggressive response might be purely as a response to her kind of aggression towards him but I imagine that pulling you know that barb out of her is probably quite sore for him as well it might yeah, he does get slapped a lot as well. But it might just be the slapping, in fact, that is, that's doing it. It might not be that it's, it's, uh, it's painful. His actual withdrawal is painful. <clears throat> Indeed, oh, she's very cross now. Given the fact that he is, you know, well, I don't know. You know, it takes a lot for him to, you can see how she has to work quite hard to make him mate with her, so maybe it is quite painful. This is just a beautiful picture of them. I think they'll do this pretty much for the rest of the day. Mate a little bit, move on a little bit. He'll try and get away from her, she'll say forget it. she does and where
whether he follows or not, I suspect. You see, he, although he likes to play hard to get, he will watch where she goes. Okay. She's now gone to sleep at the drainage line. I will sneak forward shortly. I just want to see what he does first. I'm going to move unnecessarily. I don't think he's going to follow her. I think he's had quite enough of that. Let's just roll forward and see if we can't. Just, ooh, that doesn't sound very good. I think we're okay. Andrew. Land Rover. Exactly. Land Rover, of course, is an emotional buy. If you're unless you're in an environment like we are. All right, we'll try and get, we're just kind of hang around here. I don't think we're going to move until the end of the drive. Um, while we're doing that, let's try to sort of decipher what's going to happen. Let's get head across to Brent, see what he's doing. I'm sure he's quite jealous at the moment. Sorry about that, Brent. We'll see you just now. I'm very jealous, but we've got to give James a chance sometimes. I mean, otherwise, I think he'd get a little bit sad. So we're busy checking the northern edge of the Travis area. There's been quite a lot of line tracks in all sorts of directions. And I got an update that they had a signal in Kahuma Lioness in Sibambili last night, who was calling and facing north. So I'm just double checking that she didn't, those tracks we had, they didn't change direction somewhere in the block and head out towards the northern vast expanse but also we're going to do a swing past the Gallego waterhole in case they were in this block here and it's been hot or well, it is hot not has been hot it's it is hot and it's getting hotter and just to check if there's anything taking advantage of that water Morning, Sarah. Uh, Sarah did a research project for school on the Inkahuma Pride, and Sarah's 18. And she says, during her research, she found the fact that uh, a sub-adult male lion of the Inkahuma Pride in 2008 got blinded by a spitting cobra. And she'd like to know if I've ever heard of or seen anything like that in lions and leopards. I have, sorry, stand by, just, to be on the radio for a second. Standing by. Uh, copy, thanks. So, Sarah, I've seen leopards that have not been blinded in both eye, but in a single eye. Uh, which, which we thought was by a snake, by like a spitting cobra. And I have seen it in a lion, a couple of different lionesses as well. And sometimes it is difficult uh, to guess because it could also actually be just a cataract forming. But quite often, a lot of the theories are down to spitting cobras. Sorry, just uh, looking at a track there, I got a glimmer of hope for half a second. But alas, it was an old track, it driven over. So why don't you guys guess? Let's have a little poll. By the time the sunrise safari finishes today, how hot do you think it's going to be? Uh, and send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, how hot do you think it's going to be? You can use Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. Uh, Brian, how hot do you think it's going to be? At least 38 degrees. Brian thinks it's going to be 38 degrees Celsius. And I think it's going to be 36 degrees Celsius. 
by the end of the Sunrise Safari. Morning, Cat in Tampa. Cat would like to know, is it a dry heat or is it humid heat? At the moment, I think it's somewhere in between. I think we're probably sitting on humidity of around 50, maybe 50, 60 percent. But it has been quite dry heat as well. I mean, normally at this time of the year, we would be dealing with quite a bit of humidity. But I don't know, Brian, what would you say? This is dry. It's more dry heat than humid heat, I would say. Brian? It's quite sticky. Yeah, it is thick. It, it, it is thick. So there is some humidity around, but not sort of equatorial rainforest humidity or coastal humidity. Well, Anna Marie is full of great ideas. Anna Marie says the rest of the, of the crew, the whole the Safari Live crew should spend the rest of the day having a pool party. Now, would you believe it, Anna Marie, that even a big swimming pool like we've got actually gets to a stage uh, when you do have this type of heat where the swimming pool is also hot. <laughs> and so it is incredible. But the swimming pool can get up to about 30 degrees. So we are in the grips of one of the worst droughts in many, many years uh, in South Africa. And Matt in New Zealand saying, well, where does the water come from uh, for our showers, for cooking, uh, for the swimming pool? Uh, it must be running quite low. So Matt, it's subterranean water. We have, there are multiple boreholes. Some of the boreholes are running low, but there's still two more that are, are still looking good. And they're probably averaging about taking that water from about 20 meters underground. Okay, we're going to head off towards Galago waterhole and while we do that there's a little bit of confusion about what's happening this evening. So we're about to do some quite fun stuff. So there will be a sunset safari. We will then be taking a break and we will then be doing a night drive test. Uh, we're testing out some new equipment. So we're gonna be going out a little bit later. Um, I think maybe final control can tell me exactly what time or we might not actually be sure exactly what time because of course we've got to get all the equipment set up and a lot of the times when this is very new equipment uh, so there can be some glitches but sometime I would guess within an hour after the end of the sunset safari uh, the nighttime testing well there we go 8 8 p.m. we will be trying to head out at 8 p.m. exactly and very exciting to try and see what nocturnal creatures are out and about maybe we'll get lucky enough to find some civets porcupines, white-tailed mongoose, and if we're really lucky, maybe an art fark. A pangolin. Or a pangolin, as Brian says. of answers and ready for the heat quiz and only time will tell who's going to be right so there's a 37 there's a hundred Fahrenheit and uh, I can't remember what's a hundred Fahrenheit I think that's and uh, someone says a uh, 47 degrees I think we would be expiring then and not only oh hello look who's going to do what the Wild Earth crew should be doing it just finished its morning dip to cool off. 
So no lions yet, but a spotted hyena who's been having a swim in the Galago pan. Hello, hyena. So I know on the Juma Dam cam there were a few of them swimming earlier and hyenas love water and will definitely take advantage of any of it, especially to cool down in this heat. Probably now going to go find a nice shady spot to lie up in for the rest of the day. And looking back over its shoulder, and I was trying to see what it's looking at, and I think it is looking at a William, a William who is sweeping <laughs> at Gallego Camp. The den's not too far from here, a couple of hundred meters. And let's see if we can follow it for a little while. So, Brian, who do you think is going to suffer from the heat most in our camp? James. James. Hands, down, James. Hands down, James. <laughs> Here we go. Well, the hyena's headed off down this large path that heads straight towards the den. So we're not going to follow through that thicket. And Virginia in Kentucky is probably spot on in saying that it's probably going to get warm enough. Not quite there yet, uh, but to fry eggs on the bonnet. I think by the middle of the day, if we left anything out in the sun, I think you could fry eggs on a car tire by the middle of today. And even a lot of the diurnal species that are quite often, oh, there's some Nyala running off, quite often active during the day and during the heat are going to struggle. It's on days like this that you often find elephants trying to keep as still as possible, just flapping those massive ears uh, under big marula trees. And uh, they definitely will be trying to get to the water holes probably at least twice during a day like today. And the same will go for buffalo. Well, we're going to keep checking around and uh, we'll go to the man who will be suffering in the heat, Commander Bond. They have not done much since you last left. One copulation and he is now gone off into the shade there and she is lying, well, sort of also in the shade but not quite as deeply so. If she does move off up into the sort of, um, what would we say, the forested area to the north of the bank there. I don't think we're going to be able to follow. We won't be able to get through here without driving all the way around. So let's just sit with her for a while. Things seem to have calmed down slightly. There's not quite such an um, enthusiastic mating going on. And I suspect that as the heat starts to build, so there will be much less mating going on during the day. There's a lovely atmosphere around here. Although it is starting to get quite hot, we're in the shade of a beautiful old knobthorn tree, a couple of tambuerti trees, a leadwood tree, and there's just lovely dappled light all around us. It is very quiet, like I say, not much noise at all. I'll be quiet for the next little while, you can hear. But it does give a kind of soporific atmosphere to the place. Uh, and before you came across to us, VM was stretched out along the back here, and I was stretched out over here and having a little bit of a snooze, because it's just so very relaxing to be around. Well, I've 
incredible morning and you need to digest it all, of course, and such a peaceful kind of morning that is progressing with these cats sleeping next to us. Um, Ramey, you want to know if I think that Tundi is nervous being inside Karula's territory. She looks to be the least nervous animal I've ever seen. I don't think she's nervous in the slightest, mainly because it's her mother's territory, of course. Now, while Karula might snarl and hiss at her a little bit, she certainly doesn't seem to be doing anything in the way of um, aggressive defense of her territory. And that's not uncommon. When leopards go into their mother's territories, it's very seldom that there will be an aggressive or physical encounter at all. So, no, I don't think she'd be nervous at all, Romay. I think she's very relaxed, precisely where she is. And I'm not sure what he's going to do now. I think, I think he would quite happily, if she left, he would very happily just kind of stay precisely where he is. I'm also interested to know where Mvula is at the moment. I know we had reports of him quite recently uh, being around Torchwood. And then he was on Cheetah Plains for a little while, drinking out of a pan there that they called Three in a Row Pan. And I haven't heard from him again since. And I certainly haven't seen him. When was the last time you saw him again? Well, uh, Big Cat Week, probably. The last yeah. time I saw him was Big Cat Week, which was in yeah, the end of November. So he hasn't been seen around for a while, and he is... We thought for a long time that he was only about 11 years old. But the Panthera data that we have now confirms what he looks like. He looks like he's about 13, and he is, which means that his life, well, it's reaching the, its twilight time. And so his territory will slowly shrink. You can feel the wind, maybe. Try and take a deep breath in and inhale this beautiful wind that's coming through here. Now, Mike, you're a new viewer on YouTube, and you want to know how many leopards are killed per year, but at least how many humans are killed by leopards per year. Mike, not many at all. Far more killed, of course, by uh, car accidents. You've got much more chance of being hit by a car than you do eaten by a leopard. I suspect you've probably got more chance of being struck by lightning than you have by leopards. Leopards do kill the odd person, not so much in Africa. I think probably more in India, where they're much in much more close proximity with people. But you'll find leopards can live amongst people uh, almost invisibly and not, have, not do anything to harm human beings. They will harm human beings if a, they are deeply threatened, so if you really corner a leopard, then you can be charged. It's very unlikely. You can also be eaten by a leopard, or you can be eaten by a leopard. A leopard becomes a threat when they get old and sick, and they can't find anything else to eat, and they realize how easy we are to kill. And that's when they become a little bit dangerous. It happens so seldom, though, Mike. It really doesn't happen a lot. So I'd say, I don't know, fewer than 12 or 15 people are eaten by leopards a year, if that. I mean, it's a bit like a great white shark that everybody thinks is being the most terrifying predator of the seas, which I suppose it is. But, I mean, I think something like six or seven people a year die from great white sharks. But you'd swear that it was hundreds by the terror and fear that people have of them. I think it's the same thing with most of these predators. And they're certainly not nearly as res responsible for nearly as many deaths as something like a hippopotamus or a mosquito. Of course, the mosquito is the greatest human killer of any other animal in Africa. Very, very relaxed there in the shade. I'm just going to find out who is still coming towards the sighting. And if no one is, I think we're going to think about heading out of here. Are any stations still trying to make their way towards the sighting of the mating pair? Yes, FM, do. we've only got the female with us at the moment. The male has gone up into the deep shade, but there's still a good visual of the female. So I don't know how everyone feels. Let us know. Hashtag Safari Live. Questions at wildearth.tv. Um, I'm more than happy to sit precisely where I am for the rest of the drive. But if you would like to move on and find something else, well, then let us know. Until I hear otherwise, however, I'm going to sit right where I am. I'm just going to guide this fellow in.
And of course, the inevitable question is what, why would a leopard die? What causes death um, in an older leopard? Um, Margaret, you're in Kansas and that was your question. It's normally either other leopards. Um, some of them will die of old age. That does happen every so often. Um, but normally, once they get very weak, you'll find that they won't be able to defend themselves against things like hyena. And when that happens, then it will be a hyena or another predator or another leopard that takes them out. Starvation in some areas as well. So, for example, um, Viam and I were chatting about the Cape leopard, which unsurprisingly lives in the Cape. You'll find that the Cape leopard, I think, will be much more likely to die of old age or starvation because there are no other predators there to harm it. And then Michelle in New Jersey on the sort of lifespan of leopards, you want to know, is a female more likely to live longer than a male? Yes, they do. The oldest recorded male was that Campan male who I spoke of. He was 14, I think, when he died. And then the oldest recorded female in this area, official record, is of a female called the 3-4 female. She died pushed just about her 18th birthday. There are unofficial reports of an 18-year-old leopard in this area as well, but those don't seem to be corroborated. So let's say 18 is at an outside maximum. So yes, females will live longer than males. I've now tangled myself in these wires. So while I untangle myself, Let's go and get an update from Brent to see what he's doing. We'll sit here for a little bit longer and then make a call on whether to leave or not. So as we continue to simmer in the sweltering heat, uh, we're going to check the Juma water hole. You never know what might be there. And I think sticking around water is a good idea at the moment. Ah, there's something you don't see every day. That's a at Jim Reeves, and he's probably checking boreholes at the moment. You can see the white vehicle over there. That's the Juma work bucky that does a lot of the farm management and things like that. He might even be going to check that the water was coming out into the pan. They might be pumping the pan for a bit today. Like all the animals are on hiatus at the moment, probably find find the deepest shade possible. What's going to be very interesting for those of you who watch the Juma Dam cam quite religiously. Oh, there's hyenas that are excited about something, and I can tell that I'm just going to stop here by their behaviour. Their tails are right up in the air. I think they might even just be smelling where the leopards were. But you see how that tail raised is a form of excitement. Hey, Sniffity sniff sniff. Let's try to get a bit closer. So they could just be smelling where the leopards were mating, or maybe something got killed, or maybe there was a, a new hyena that came through the area, maybe a dispersal male hoping to join a new clan. But very, very distinct excitement behavior. Not overly excited, otherwise we would hear the maniacal cackling and whooping. See, they're continuing to walk with their, their tails up. Maybe Queen Karula made a kill in this area and they're tracking it. Maybe she's hidden in one of the big marula trees just in front of Final Control. We've had that before. Let's see where these hyenas lead us. Look at that, almost fighting over the right to smell the same spot. I 
absolutely fascinating creatures. So I'm just checking carefully into the trees. There's some nice deep shade on some of those marulas. So we're going to stay a little bit further away, not to disturb their sniffing. Focus on these hyenas and this really interesting behavior they're giving at the moment. And I said it's, it's a possibility they could just be smelling where Tangana and Tandi were mating last night and they still get excited by the smell of leopards. Or Karula might have made a kill in the area and they're trying to figure out where it went. Or it could be a dispersal male hyena that they've smelt moving into the area. It's not ecstatic excitement, and it's, it tail's dropped a little bit, but there definitely is serious interest there. And watch, watch if she, as she puts her nose to the ground again or catches a scent. Watch the tail. There we go, picked a direction, tails are up again. So I think it almost looks like they're tracking a drag. straight towards final control at the moment and there are some lovely big trees there that an animal like a leopard if it did make a kill might take advantage of so it has to be something that's going to the hyenas think the, the reward is worth moving around in this heat because normally they would be chilling out. James Richard says, well, during one of the night tests, wouldn't it be cool if we were able to see a hyena hunt? It's not something we ever really see. Uh, that is true, uh, James. And in this area, probably harder to follow than wild dogs on the hunt. It's because their hunting strategy is to keep going for long periods of time. And it'll be very difficult for us to follow them through the bush. So they're now walking directly in front of final control. It seems like they've given up on whatever they were smelling. So probably smelling just where the leopards were last night. term but a term I really like used for hyenas uh, being the only truly matriarchal and female dominated society we get you out, out here in the bush uh, I've heard them often called the sisterhood before now this is a very serious sisterhood you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of I'm not seeing any drag marks on the ground. I have seen a few leopard tracks though. So I think they might just have been smelling where Tandi and Tingana. And there goes. And carry on down the road. Or maybe they're going to join the Safari Live crew for breakfast at the DRC. We'll find out shortly. 
and it is and it is a it is a bacon and egg day for us so maybe the hyenas caught a whiff and yes <laughs> we're taking the turn straight towards camp so let's see if uh, we have any of our staff members who get a fright as we come past them as the two hyenas lope towards the DRC. We got a workshop behind the hyena there. Tandakila and Frank better be careful, they might be coming for the bacon. They're probably heading back towards the den. So we're right at the entrance of our camp as these hyenas, they're going to cross here shortly. So these hyenas are heading back towards the den at the moment. It should pop out in five, four, Three, two, and my timing's off. Oh, there we go. That's what they're smelling. Hold on, guys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Apparently, Karula's back just behind us at the water hole. Oops. So, let's leave the hyenas. They're moving back towards the dam. Let's go see if we can catch up with the Queen of Juma. And there we go. Look, this is how much we live in the bush. Oops. Sorry, it's a new clutch I'm not quite used to yet. Exciting! I was sort of secretly hoping the more we perused around this area that she was still around. The tracks have been around. I wonder where she's hiding. Maybe in the thickets. Maybe she does actually have a carcass and the hyenas got sent off the scent trail by the wind. Here we go. And as we approach, I can't see her yet. Oh, there she is. Hello, Queen Karula. Epic morning, three leopards. Isn't that incredible? Now, where have you been? I'm sure you've got meat around here somewhere. So just after the sunrise foray yesterday, she came for, for a drink, but I think she might have come a bit earlier today due to the intense heat we are, are feeling at the moment. And she's being quite wise drinking out of where the pump is pumping water at the moment and not that fetid fetid waste water that the hippos have polluted so unfortunately the wind is blowing quite strongly at the moment so you might be getting a bit of wind noise on the new microphone we will try in one of our tech geniuses to sort that out at some point Brian and myself are the we oh getting up slightly upset with the other hippo whose nose touched his bottom. So Richard in Colorado is wondering, will we pump water? into various water holes if the drought becomes severe. Richard, the drought is already severe and we will continue to pump, Wajima will continue to pump two water holes. And this and the other one in front of Gallego Camp. Very thirsty kitty. 
So if we do have any new viewers, this is the dominant female leopard of our area. And she is the, actually the mother of uh, the female you've been seen mating with James. He's been mating, sorry, not mating with James, mating with Tingana with, while James has been voyeuring. But she does look like she's got a nice fat belly. I didn't see her yesterday. So I think she does have a carcass close by. And that's why she's coming back and food from the water. That was really interesting to have a look at her. Belly. I can't really see whether this. Oh, there we go. The, the queen has joined her pollution to the water hole. Now, Scott and I walked this drainage system here completely yesterday and we didn't see her. Maybe we just missed her and she was lying in a tree and we walked right under her. She's an incredible animal on foot. Um, very, very relaxed uh, when we track her on foot and often we can sort of stand 20, 20 meters from her and spend half an hour watching her and she completely ignores us. The stations have uh, another Mafazi Ingwe at the Vuyatela in front of the Tele camp, animals now mobile uh, southeast towards the dam wall. Hey, Firm, she's looking quite full and she's heading into that same area we we're looking for her yesterday. So maybe she's got some nyama stashed in the, in the drainage system. Firm. Okay guys, we're just going to shoot around quickly. stomach yet and we are checking for suckle marks there is a small possibility that the cub she had a while ago is possibly still alive although I said that is unlikely but you never know stranger things have happened gorgeous creature. So look at that, she's just in front of us. And I'm trying to have a look now at her, her stomach there, Brian. Is she a bit too... Difficult to see when she's not lying down. I mean, her her nipples are. Anyway, she's coming right next to me. Hello, madam. So her nipples are definitely enlarged and they're quite easily visible. Now, that doesn't mean she still has cubs. Now, because her body will still be producing milk for some time after she, if she has lost cubs. I didn't see any distinct suckle marks, but as I said, very difficult while she's up and about. And of course, she's going to go into quite a difficult area. I'm just gonna stop here to see where it's my best, best route is going to be. There on the edge. She's on the move again. We don't want to lose her. Oh, she's 
popped into this <laughs> ravine. Am I being blind? Yeah. Cheek, cheek, yeah. Across the ravine? No, in the ravine. Oh, I can't in see. I, I can't see. She's directly below. No, no, no. She's straight ahead of us. Straight. You see these bushes in front of us? Yes. These two bushes? Down. Oh, I, I see her there. Now. Okay, there we go. Well spotted, Brian. Maybe her, that's maybe why we couldn't find her. She's been sleeping in a ravine. Let's just try and get you into a spot where we can get a view. There we go. Sorry, guys. Let me just. Mike, you're not going to get any visual from that side. You need to come uh, next to me. There we go. Let me just get out of the way. She's found a wonderful, cool spot. Now, I wonder if she hasn't stashed a carcass in here somewhere. And that's maybe why we couldn't find her yesterday. We were walking probably about 20, 30 meters from here, but none of us looked in the ravine itself. She's got a full belly. She's just had a nice drink. She's found a really, really great little bit of shade. I don't think you're going to find a much cooler spot than that on Juma today. Unfortunately, the way she's lying, it's going to make it very difficult for me to see any suckle marks, if there are any. Lynn says maybe she's got a den around here. She seems to come here a lot. Uh, Lynn, either a den or some meat. Uh, if she's got a killer stashed close by here somewhere, she'll also move in and out quite quickly. Or well, not quite quickly, quite frequently, rather. Looks like she's got the top spot to spend a sweltering summer's day. I don't think she's going to move too much from here. Having a careful look around. See if there's a kill, maybe, possibly somewhere. Uh, James Richard is saying her nipples did look more apparent. But as I said, that isn't necessarily that she still has cubs. It could be that she's just still, her body's still producing milk. Lying up in an undercut that is made by rain, water rushing through there. Of course, not this year. It looks like she's done very well to find a perfect spot to spend the day. Heavy panting. Mike would like to know how often do lion and leopard come into contact and what is the usual scenario when that happens? Mike, relatively often, but uh, normally the leopards get out of the way and climb a tree or, or spot or see the lions before they arrive and, and run away. And normally, maybe the lions might chase the leopard up a tree, but that's about as bad as it gets. It's very unusual for them to actually catch an adult leopard.
So Sandra is saying if she does in fact have cubs, we will know when she decides to show us. Well, Sandra, most leopards in the Sabi Sands, throughout all the lodges, uh, when we suspect they have cubs, we will we will generally try to track them on foot till we can find them. And depending on the age of the cubs, then make a plan from there. Whether we zone the area, which means no vehicles will absolutely be allowed. And that's normally till those cubs are a bit older and the rule is sort of tree climbing age. You tend to stay away from them till they're tree climbing age and they've got a fair chance to escape any potential predators that might wander in. Now leopard cubs, as I said, have a very high mortality rate for their first year of life on 75% and that changes as soon as they hit that year mark. then it increases greatly for females and males. Males have another dip, not a major dip, when they get to about four or five years old where they start challenging for, for territory. And then again, a very stable sort of life platform, very, very, very high success rate and survival rate till uh, they get males till about 12, 13, and females sort of 14, 15. And then obviously that dips as they get towards the end of the age. But what an incredible morning mating leopards with James and the queen of Juma, Karula, here right at the end. Those funny, funny looking hyenas sniffing around. I think they might have been sniffing her or, or where Tangana and Tandi were this morning or last night. But let's go see what James is up to for the last bit of the show. The thumb is going to come say goodbye too and I'll see you on the sunset safari. What a morning indeed it has been. Over there, a lilac-breasted roller, and beyond them, a little sounder of warthogs huddling in the shade. Now, we went past a huge herd of impala just now, and they too were huddling in the shade. It's like they know how hot it's going to get today. And I think that most of the animals are going to be running for as much shade as they can possibly find today. Um, also, a little bee eater quickly. Sorry, there's a bee eater right next to the roller there on the dead tree. Looks like a little bee eater. So, it's going to be a difficult time for the birds. It's going to be a difficult time for the mammals. It's going to be a pretty difficult time for everyone out here. We are going to be running for the shade during the course of the day. What an incredible time we've had of it this morning. Two mating leopards, very special indeed. We will see you this afternoon, of course, at about 4 o'clock. Heat allowing, I just do warn you that I think it's going to be too hot, but we'll keep you posted, keep an eye out on the Twitter. Thank you, Viam, for your efforts today. Uh, marvelous to see mating leopards with you again. And uh, we will also be doing a night drive this evening, testing out a thermal drone. We don't know how that's gonna work. That will be after night drive, our normal drive sometime, probably around half past eight-ish. We'll catch up with you back then. A big thanks to Brent, of course, on the other vehicle with Brian, and of course, to Kirsty, and I'm not sure who's assisting her today. I think it's Leanne. We will see you later this afternoon. Stay safe and happy wherever you are. Bye-bye.